Welcome back to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. I am I'm absolutely thrilled to have uh, Jeff Gibbard with me. Jeff is an author, podcaster, a speaker, a strategist, and most importantly, he's a superhero. And he helps small companies, individuals get better every day. So uh, I think he's my newfound hero when he tells me how he works and how much time he spends with his daughter and his family. So uh, I'm interested and uh, I'm really excited to, to talk more about this. Jeff, thanks for thanks for coming on today. Cool, man. My pleasure. Craig, thank you for having me. So talk about talk about the Superhero Institute a little bit and, and, and say, you know, tell us what you're up to. Yeah. So the Superhero Institute is probably the most um, uh, eye catching thing that I do when people look at my my body of work because like, mm, tell me about that. Superheroes, you know, they're very popular right now. So what it is, it's a coaching certification program that I'm working on. It's currently still in development. There's a web page up. There's like a waiting list and things like that. But what it is, is it's going to be a curriculum that helps people to become, um, you know, better coaches and actually improve their coaching business, but through a particular methodology that helps them to unleash the potential of the people that they're coaching. So I have a, a methodology called the superhuman framework. I can talk a little bit about that, but it's essentially a method for personal improvement, self, uh, self-improvement and growth. And, uh, and I think it's pretty useful. Uh, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, and then, as you mentioned, I, I also am an author. I just released my book, uh, my first book, The Lovable Leader back in January. Um, so that's another thing I'm really excited about. And, uh, and aside from that, I've just spent most of my life being a strategist because I'm really good at seeing patterns. Awesome. So, you, you know, before we came on, you were talking about you, you, you started a marketing agency, grew it, sold it. And now you're a solopreneur working four days a week. And the one thing you, you'd really mentioned about was self-improvement Yeah. and 20 out of 20 on self-improvement. And I speak when I, when I go to conferences and I speak, I talk to CEOs about hiring people who need the A and that could be a single mom who's got kids, but you know, her, her need for the A is to see her kids grow and develop and be whatever. So you, you hire people who really need it and want it. You know, what's your talk about self-improvement? Yeah. When, so before we jumped on and you were talking about that, I was so interested in that because that, that phrase that you just said, like the person that needs the A, a little bit of that is triggering for me. But on the other side, I also see what I think you mean by that. So because I have ADHD and I struggled a little bit in school because of the structure of how school is, I thought for a, a good number of years throughout my life that I was very average moderate intelligence type person. And it wasn't until later in life where I understood what it meant for me to have ADHD and was able to actually um, really get clear about um, and getting comfortable with the way that I need to work to thrive, that I began to see what my real potential was. And that's when I started getting really obsessive about personal growth and self-improvement and started trying to really understand what are the meta abilities that lead you to be able to grow and improve as a human. Um, so when you say like, the person that needs the A, what, what occurs to me in that statement is about what is the thing that's driving that person, which is, I think what you mean there, like, cause when you yep. sit, when you say like getting the grade, you think like, oh, this person is chasing the recognition and the value, the letter grade. Right. But I think what you're actually saying is this person has a thing that they must go and achieve. Absolutely. Yeah. You know it's not, it's not about, Hey, I need, I, I need the, the uh, needing the A is meaning somebody who's driving to achieve something in their life versus somebody who's wandering sort of aimlessly who doesn't care. Exactly. And, and I saw that with, from the examples you gave, I, I knew what you meant, but even when I hear things about grades, I, like I get triggered and go back to like high school. Oh God, <laughs> yeah. I swear I'm smart. I swear. So, you know, one of the things that I think a lot about, and this is true in the book I wrote on leadership, it's true yeah. on the work I do in the superhero Institute, it's true in the work I do as a strategist with my clients is that I try to understand what is the why that's driving someone. What's the thing mm -hmm that's going to unlock their effortlessness in moving towards their goal. So when, uh, when I think about what, what drives me to become my best and what, what uh, is causing me to be on this personal improvement journey is that um, I'm a huge fan of Spider-Man and I've always uh, really latched onto that with great power. There must also come great responsibility. And I see that as I level up and I grow and I acquire more skills, I just simply become more capable and able to make, dramatic improvements in, in the material conditions of people's lives. So yeah. whether that's the clients I'm working with or whether it's in a social movement or whatever, the more knowledge I have, the more power I have to affect change. So that's what kind of drives me is I'm out on a mission to try and make the world kinder, safer, and more equitable. And I do that across everything that I'm working on. So that's my drive of why I am so obsessive about the personal improvement thing. 
Yeah, well, the, yeah, the, the the personal improvement thing, and I, th- yeah, and you just talked about it, you know, kinder, safer, and more equitable. And I think like when you talk about, you know, there's a personal responsibility. There's a personal responsibility in equity, and it's you know, just because you have it doesn't mean I deserve it. It's hey, I will show you how to improve and how to get it. But I think that there's a personal responsibility in people going, hey, look, I, I want it. What do I need to do to change? Or would I, what do I need to do to get a piece of whichever it is I want? Either more money, more time, more freedom, more, you know, whatever. And that, you know, that all becomes from, a, all right, what do I need to do to get there? My yeah. I, I, and I think that, um, so I'm very, um, I would say, evenly balanced on personal responsibility and kind of social responsibility. I think the systems need to be there to support the opportunity for everyone to achieve. And I think there needs to be a strong enough um, fallback and safety in our organizations and our societies and our homes where people have the freedom to take some of those risks, right? It's like you don't walk a, 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 a tight wire without a net underneath, right? So in the same way, I think we need to provide that across everything. But then at the same time, if you want to be able to make it across that tight rope, you're going to need to practice. You can need to put the work in. You're going to need to know why you want to walk across it in the first place. So I'm very much of the belief that each of us has something that's driving us and we need to find what that is. And we need to just make sure that the the systems that we're all a part of allow us to have whatever that personal goal that is that we're after. Yeah, no. And and you said it like, you know, companies, for instance, you you hire great people who are continually trying to improve your organization. You, You give them the resources they need to be successful, but you allow them to fail on occasion. Without yep. penalty, because if people are just not failing, they're not, you know, it's, it's, it, so I was a naval aviator. And first thing we learned in flight school was if you're not cheating, you're not trying. You know, it's, it's, you put yourself out there a little bit, push the edge. If you fail, it's okay. Just make sure you're being, you know, do it safely. Yeah. 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 So okay. one of the, so I have three core pillars in my book of leadership, of lovable leadership. The three pillars are care, trust, and safe travels. So safe mm-hmm. travels is kind of what we're talking about here, which is that you're setting a destination, you're setting a goal. You want to go somewhere. You actually have to provide safety along the way. So you were an aviator. So the example I always use is actually using planes, yeah. right? Like if I was going to take a flight from New York to Los Angeles, the important part is not just that I got on the plane. The important part is actually that I get off the plane in Los Angeles safely, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the that's the important part of that journey. The destination is one piece, but it's the actual safety on the way to that destination. And I think the same thing is true in our organizations, that if we want people to achieve amazing things, if we want to set a big, bold destination for them, we have to make sure that it's safe for them to get there. Mm-hmm. And we have to make sure that they have the freedom to take some risks, that they also know that they can put their best work in without fear yep. so that they can keep keep driving towards it. Yep. And you also mentioned something really interesting about, you know, people are putting in the work and trying to make the organizations better. I think the sooner organizations realize that the way that they can get people to do that is that they need to realize that people are trying to make their own material lives better. They want to grow. They want to accomplish things. They want to be acknowledged. And when you give them the freedom to do those things, they can then contribute to your organization. No, I hundred percent, I hundred percent agree with you. And, and the, the, the employer employee, you know, the employer wants, people who will come in or the company wants people who will come in and do what they're paid to do every day. And they'll give, they'll give it their best for the eight hours they're at work. They're expected to give their best, but on the flip side and, and rightfully so, and, and, you know, employees want to know that their lives are being better. And that's the big thing today is people want to know that they can make a difference in society that they're, they're working to achieve something that will better, you know, the world in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And, you know, look, that may not be a trend that pe- you know, businesses were comfortable with 10 years ago. It's the new world and it yeah. ain't changing and it ain't changing. So if you're, I think if you're a company, you better have a mission statement. You better, you know, Talk to your employees. You better get down on the floor with them. You better get in the trenches with them in the nitty gritty and say, hey, look, this is why we're why we're doing this. And if you can't do that, you're going to fail. Yeah. And I, you know, as you said that, the thought that crossed my mind was like, is it actually a new world? Did people, did what we want out of our jobs change? Or is it just now something that we talk about? Right. Like I don't think my parents wanted to just go and grind away 
in a job that they didn't like and not be treated as a human being and just be treated as a number that has a job function that needs to hit certain metrics. Like I think they always probably want to be treated like people because I don't think fundamentally people have changed that much over the last several thousand years with regard to how we want to interact, right? So I think it's interesting because it feels like so much has changed. But when I think about it kind of at a deeper level about people, so much is probably still the same. And I think the difference is, is that we just, the culture is really what's evolving to allow for certain conversations to happen more freely, that mm -hmm. we want to be treated with respect, that we want a job that we care about, that we don't want to have to like, you know, leave our, leave our lives at the door when we walk in. And so much of that is probably changed as a result of how technology has changed our working relationships, that we take our email home with us. We okay. take our you know, our phone calls in our pocket at work from, you know, regarding our kids. So I think just so much of those lines have blurred that maybe that's partly what's changing the conversation. We, we, you talked about it before we came on, you talked about you work four days a week. Yep. You spend Friday with your daughter and you set boundaries. You don't talk to clients. You don't imagine, you know, I, I'm not that good, quite frankly. I, I, you know, I, uh, I still teach you. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not that good, but I, you know, but I, I've gotten to the point now where I do get texts at 10 o'clock at night. And I, yeah, my phone is muted and I don't answer. I'll answer him in the morning at eight o'clock, not at six, you know, but at eight or nine, if you're texting me at 10 o'clock at night, you know, you, you know, but, that, but that's the new expectation from people. It's like, you know, you know, are you, what do you, how are you coaching your business, you know, your, your business clients and how are you coaching your other clients about boundaries and, set yeah. them and, and, and how is that improving them? So I look at it this way. I think if you're good at what you do, you can basically name your price, right? Like the example I use with my clients all the time is like, you know, I'll be talking to one thing that most of my clients can count on me for is that I'm going to raise their prices. Yeah. And part of the reason of that is the example I'll give to them all the time is, you know, they'll say, oh, well, what if the client wants it for less? I'll be like, let's imagine that Tony Robbins or Barack Obama walked into a room and, you know, they're there to speak and the, the event organizer says, hey, do you, do you think you could flex on their fee? They're going to be like, I'm Barack Obama. I'm Tony Robbins. No, this is my fee, right? Like right. they don't move because the event organizer, you know, wants it for a lesser price. They mm -hmm. know the value of what they bring. They know they're, they're, they're a brand of one that no, nobody else can, uh, can replicate. So they know that they have the ability to command the price that they want. Right. And mm -hmm. I think the same thing is true for every single person. When you decide this is what my value is, these are what my boundaries are and you lay them out there. Now I'm not saying this is easy, but what I tried doing at the very beginning, and this is what I've encouraged my clients to do is try to understand what's important to you and then build your business around those values. Right. So for instance, if my value was to make as much money as possible, there's no way I'd work a four day work week. Absolutely not. That's crazy. There's a whole other day worth of billable hours that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. But if my goal is to work as few hours as possible and make a good living, a certain living that I need to make to cover my responsibilities and have a little bit extra and mm -hmm. spend as much time with my kids as possible and that the work I do makes the most impact, then I'm going to structure everything around those goals. Yeah. And I encourage my clients to do the same thing. And, and I think the truth of the matter is you only really should work with people who respect your boundaries. If yep. you say, here's how I work, I don't take calls after five o'clock and someone calls you after five o'clock, you say, hey, just a reminder, I don't take calls after five o'clock. I'm going to make the exception this one time, but please don't call me after five uh, mm -hmm. any other day. And if they continue to you know, transgress, then you have a conversation about why this is probably not a good fit. And you have to have the courage to be able to fire a client or to fire a partner or, or whoever that, that's, not, that's not meeting your boundaries because you set those boundaries and you can enforce those boundaries. Yeah, but this is why I like, you know, go back to your equity thing. And this is why I'm, I'm a huge believer in education. And if you want it, if you really want an equitable society, you hold parents accountable for their kids' education and you hold kids accountable for their education. So they're smart and they're intelligent and they can critically think because ultimately it's education. And no matter where you are in the, in the you, you could have a college degree and be uneducated in your business or you can whatever, but, but ultimately that power comes from ability and education. And, you know, when you're able to put the power back in your life, you can have those conversations. You know, I, you're, I'm not taking your call after five, you know, and you're not worried about if you get fired, because if you get fired, you know, the next guy is 
is there and ready. Yeah. And that is when you have freedom in life. When you, when you have freedom in life is when you can sit there and say, hey, okay, I am really good at what I do because I'm educated. I learn. I know the business. I know what I'm doing. Boom. And, you know, but it all starts with, it all starts with education. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, the first part of the superhuman framework is learning. The second part is thinking. Third part is communication. Fourth part is leadership. And the fifth part is putting it into action. And when you put all those things together, that's how you develop new abilities. It's how you advance to become a superhuman. Um, so obviously I'm, a, I'm very big on learning. Uh, I read a lot. It's become one of my favorite activities. I didn't like it when I was a kid because I mostly was forced to read fiction and I just can't, I can't follow fiction because of my ADHD. I forget who people are. I can't, I don't, there's no faces. <laughs> it sounds silly, but like, there's no pictures. I don't know if I could read a fiction book. That's why I like comics. But when I discovered nonfiction, I became really obsessed with the idea of like every one of these books I read, I think of my, my brain, almost like a set of Legos. Like I'm like bolting on a new Lego. And then when you discover systems and processes to be able to take notes and capture those ideas and refine them over time, building, like I have a whole second brain system that I've built. Um, that's how I continually refine and build the knowledge that I have. But back to something you said about, you know, the responsibility of education, you know, this is, this is part and parcel of, um, one of the things I feel very strongly about is I'm with you. I think education is, is everything. And I think yet, yeah, and again, this is the balance of the personal and the, and the social, I think parents have an enormous responsibility, and I think the individual that's learning has an enormous responsibility, but we also need to structure the systems that people are in to allow for that to happen. A good example I gave, you know, we could go down a lot of different paths with this. You could look at like, you know, underprivileged communities and things like that, but like even just taking one that's very familiar to me, having ADHD, school is not well set up for a person like me. So for a lot of years, I thought I was stupid <clears throat> because I couldn't do things in this very linear way, but I had superpowers and I didn't even realize it that they were superpowers because they didn't fit the mold of what I needed to do to, to yeah. succeed in, in school. And which is why I think, I, I think probably the concept that you're talking about is not necessarily schooling, but it's broadly learning. education, learning. It's the expansion learning. of your knowledge and your abilities to do things. And I'm a hundred percent with you on that, no matter who you are across walks of life. If you, if you're, um, given the opportunity to realize this perspective that the more information and knowledge and understanding and ability to connect with others that you gather and are able to refine as an ability, the further you're going to go in life because everything is people and people are going to need mm -hmm. people who have different skills and abilities. So the more you enhance that, the, the further you're going to go. Yeah, no. And I, and I, and I get it. You know, when you talk about like public school education, you're right. You know, it's, it's one size fits all. And you've got people with a thousand different needs and, and you can't, you know, it's very hard to do that. Like we said, my daughter's diabetic. You know, we had to pull her out of public school because they just didn't know how to deal with her diabetes. Yeah. It was very challenging. And, and they, that's they, scary. They, and they were set up to rules and they were set up to, you know, they had their rules and you, you said, okay, I get it. You know, eventually you go, I get it. You can't, man, you know, we can't, you know, within the confines of what you're restricted to, it's not going to, it's not going to work. So it's on me to go find, an alternate solution. And that's, you know, but that's where people need to, you know, that's where I think folks in their own lives come in. They go, all right, I under, I understand the confines of this company I work for. Is it working for me? Do they need to go look elsewhere? No. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe. I mean, hey, look, when the headhunter gets headhunter, I got headhunted. Yeah. Conversation was, look, there's two things I want in life. I do great. I mean, I do great. I, I you know, my, you know, money wise, fine. Happiness. Great. What's going to catch my interest? Either same amount of money on half the work or double the income on the same amount of work. Yep. It's a very, and if you can't do it, that's okay. Yep. If you can't do it, I don't care. You know, it's, we're good. I'm a hundred percent. Let's go be friends. That, we'll go be friends. You I had a yeah. guest on my podcast. Uh, I just want to give him a shout out on it. Uh, this guy, Joe Sanok, he wrote a book called the four day work week. Um, or sorry, it's called um, Thursday is the new Friday, but it's about a four day work week. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I talked to him, he gave a lot of tips for people who are at companies, because for people like you and me, we're solopreneurs, mm -hmm. we can kind of decide to do whatever we want. It either works or it doesn't, then we figure it out. But like, if you're working at a company, your your rank and file or your manager, or whatever, how do you go about setting those boundaries and changing your work schedule? And sometimes really really right. difficult, but he actually wrote a really good book and had some really good tips on it. I don't really know how to navigate a corporate environment. I am psychologically unemployable. So 
you know, I don't know how to navigate that environment. I don't do business politics. I just kind of say, here's how I am. Um, but I, I thought he did a really good job of kind of explaining how one goes about. And I think you can apply a lot of the same lessons to other boundaries you might have. Yeah, but this is where I talk to business leaders and they want to hire somebody. And I go, look, at the end of the day, get the eight hour, you know, the nine to five or the whatever out of your head. Yeah. You're you know, at the level that I'm recruiting for, you are hiring people to achieve a result, a goal. If they can achieve the goal in one day and take 365 days off, kind of like that analogy, you know, the guy goes into the ship and he bangs it on a hammer. Oh, I used to put that in my proposal. The, the, the motor, the, you know, the motor, you know, and it's like, if the person can achieve the goal in one day and take 364 days off, what do you care? You know, and, and don't sit there and say, oh, well, if he could do that, we're going to start making increasing the goals. Yep. That's it. Yeah. If it takes, a, you know, if you're setting a goal and the person says, I can achieve that goal, they do it in a day and they take 364 off, you know, good on them. If they told you they can do it and it takes them 365, you know, that's, you know, that's a different conversation, right? Yeah. But this, I got to be on top of this person. I got to be micromanaging them. I've got to be, you know, that says less about them and more about you as a leader. It yep. really means you're a horrible leader. You have yeah. No well, I mean, like I said, one of the three pillars of lovable leadership is trust. And, yeah. you know, I feel like that is such, that is the currency of our work environments is that without trust, you can't have safety without trust. It's very, it's very difficult to actually get authentic care. Right. So trust is the currency that we pass between one another. And, um, you know, it, if you're not, if you're micromanaging, it's, it really is just the clear signal that there's a lack of trust in that other person. And it's a lack of trust in your ability to be resilient as an organization, that if that person does mess up, that you're going to be able to bounce back from it. Like really what's the worst thing that's going to happen? Probably in most cases, not that much, not at least what your, your biggest fear inside is. Placed an executive in a company not too long ago, you know, sea level. <clears throat> and for 30 days, it was touch and go. It's kind of like getting married. The yeah. worst fights I ever had with my wife when we got married were in the first 30 days because, you know, we we're trying to figure out how to di divide up the closet, how to, you know. You know oh, so you learned the lesson that you just give her the closet, right? What's, well, yeah, well, yeah, it took me a little while to do that, but, you know, but yeah, it took an argument to, but you think about it, you know, it's like, hey, look, it's brand new. And the guy called me up and says, I'm out. I'm ready to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm like, don't quit. You know, you guys are, you know, there's a little bit of trust building here. He doesn't know you from Adam. You know, he needs to know that he can trust you. Yep. On the flip side, you need to know that he's going to respect you and listen to your counsel and guidance. You know, they had to come to Jesus. They had yeah. a pretty, they had a nasty falling out. You know, good for them. They had, they had a pretty nasty little falling out 30 days in. Guy calls me up and says, we're good. We're good. We understand each other now. Productive conflicts, sometimes productive conflicts. It. This is what I need to do to make him comfortable. This is what he sees, what I'm capable of doing. We're good. This is why I think the first 30 days are so epically important and the first 60 days, and the first 90 days, but that the first 30 days for any leader is mm -hmm. I think 100% about people. I think any, any looking at your job function and what you're going to be doing, I think it's almost irrelevant, honestly, because mm -hmm. you cannot actually count on all of the people on your team to do the things that they need to do and to reach that next level and to, and to follow your leadership if you don't have a good relationship with them. And that first 30 days, I think is the most critical first impressions that you can make. I've screwed it up in the past, like yep. really badly. And, um, and, you know, I kind of realized like where my strengths and, and weaknesses lie there, but I, I still, when I coach people and they're taking over a new role or something like that, I will talk to them very much about this first 30 days. You should be sitting down with people every single day in one way or another it should be part business it should be part you know, really getting to know them. Just let your curiosity guide you. Yep. You think about that new hire you bring on board for 30 days, 60 days. They're really uncomfortable. Oh yeah. Everything's new. People are new. They're trying to, they're really uncomfortable. And you know, that, that 30 days is when you need to be taking them in every day and going, all right, what, what are you uncomfortable? What every day have a conversation with them. And, yeah. You know, but how many leaders, they close their door. We were, I was talking on a podcast with a friend of mine. He says he wish, used to work for this guy. Not only he closed his door, but he would turn out the light and they would have a little, he would have like a little lamp on his desk. You know, it was like, okay. a, it was like a lawyer desk or a, yeah. you know, you know, and 
he turned on a little lamp, you know, with, and, and, you know, and the door was shut and he would be the leader. That was his idea of, you know, I think what a horrible, what, what kind of style is that? You know, kick the guy out. Yeah. Um, you know, the leader is the person who's down on the, is on the floor every day. Yeah. You know, how are you doing? What's happened? Where are we? What do you need help with? What's the goal? Imagine all the learning that's lost by leaders that don't do that. Like the people who are on your team that are doing the work that are uncomfortable for one reason or another, or who are excited for one reason or another, they are providing the most valuable intelligence that you can get in your business because they're telling you all of the things that future people are potentially going to be uncomfortable with, that they're going to struggle with, that they're going to be excited about. And you can actually restructure your work environment to take advantage of those strengths, mitigate and minimize those weaknesses. So missing out on that opportunity to talk to them isn't just about building a relationship. It's also amazing in, you know, yeah. discovery. You can learn so much about your own business that way. Absolutely. Communication. It all comes down to communication. I was, I was reading this article still. about, I was loving this article about Coinbase. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Where the employees started tweeting, you know, they had no confidence and I'm thinking, well, all right, if I'm the CEO of that company, I'm probably going to fire you because you're going public with stuff that should be kept private. You know, you're not doing, you know, but on the flip side, you know, maybe I didn't open the door wide enough for you to come and tell me about your, you know, what, what's your, what's your concerns, what's happening. Yep. You know, so there's a, you know, there's a, a give and take there where there's, you know, the employees, you know, look, activists, I'm not a big fan of activist employees. If you want to go be an activist, you know, go support dogs or, you know, you know, fur, you know, fur friendly fabric or whatever, go, go do it somewhere else. Don't be an activist inside my company. But on the flip side, if you got problems in the company and you can't bring it to leadership, that's a leadership issue. hundred percent. hundred percent. So it's funny because I feel like activist employees are probably a result of an environment in which they feel the need to be activists in that employee. A good example is what's going on with unions right now. You know, if, if that, if that wasn't such a, a struggle between ownership and labor, you know, then there wouldn't be this constant struggle between the two of them. There wouldn't be this mm -hmm. friction, this argument. There wouldn't be people getting called out, people getting fired, all of this uh, bad blood passing back and forth. Well, so, God, I'm sorry. No, I, yeah. I, so I, I was just going to say, I think that, the, you know, the union is a, it's a good example. If you look at that of, you know, if the conditions were incredible, there probably wouldn't be a movement towards labor organizing. Well, the, the thing about unions, and this is what drives me nuts, is it's a us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. Management versus worker. I think and, it's owner versus worker, but yeah. I or, or, well, if I, if I go to General Motors or American Airlines, American Airlines is one of the most you know, tenuous, you know, tenuous management versus mechanics you know, dichot I don't know, dichotomy or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're looking at it going, well, one, it shouldn't be that we're one team, you know, we're all one team. We're one company, you know, everybody's needs need to be taken care of. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the management of the company or the, the, the leaders of the company need their airplanes flying. They need them fixed. They need them safe. They need them, you know, on time. The mechanics in the company are highly skilled. Do not diminish their do not diminish their you know, capability because they get their fingers dirty every day. They are highly skilled. They are people too, and you know they come to work every day and they show up and they do about the best they can. Now you have this friction in between. Somewhere there's this friction in between. You go, how do we break down that barrier? Well, one, it's not us versus you. It's all of us together. We are all in this canoe. Do not drill holes in the canoe because you're not happy with the, with the captain uh, type of deal. So see, I, I'll push back on that because I feel like if everybody in the canoe was happy, you wouldn't have those issues. That's kind of my point about what I was saying about the unions in general is that like, if the conditions didn't call for the need for it, then you probably wouldn't see that. Right. So what are the grievances? What are they upset about? Because I think a lot of where you see friction in, in like union, uh, like, you know, labor versus owners and things like that is that the, the spoils of the, the success of the company aren't shared equitably. So that's generally where that comes from. So I guess going back to the point about activist employees, 
I think when the conditions are that people are really happy in their job, they feel like they're adequately compensated, that things are pretty equitable across the board in terms of who gets compensated and how they get compensated, the work environment, the, you know, can you work remote? Do you have to be in the office? Like all the different things. If there was uh, an environment where those needs, the needs of the, the people working there are generally met, you usually don't see that sort of outspoken friction. But mm -hmm. you brought up the Coinbase guy, and I think that that's a really good example of it. He's like, if you don't like it here, quit. You can take that same exact scenario and handle it 12 different ways that don't sound that horrible. You know I, what I mean, yeah. you can, yeah. you can, and, and, and I think that's the thing about it is I think leaders underestimate really how simple it is to make progress towards better. Maybe not ideal for every single person. You're never mm -hmm. going to get everybody happy, but to move towards environments where more people are happy requires small shifts, care more about the people on your team, create environments where they trust you and you trust them. That way, you know, they're not questioning your every single motive and you're not questioning theirs. And if you provide safety for them to do what they're trying to do on the way to their destination, you create an environment where they don't have to operate in fear. You generally don't have those kind of work environments where there is that friction between the different levels because they are working together as one team. That's how you yeah. get the alignment is that care, that trust and that safety. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And then it comes down to, look, if you've got a company with you know, like Amazon with, I don't know, a million, I think they're up to about a million employees or Walmart with a million employees. Look, you're not going to make everybody happy. Yeah. It's and like at the end of the day, And it, yeah, not even a possibility. And, and at the end of the day, if you're working there and it's not scratching your itch, you know, it's up to you to go, hey, look, they're limited in what they can do. They got a million people to take care of. I'm just one. If this isn't scratching my itch, I got to go. I got to go move on to something different. They're not going to change for me. I'm not going to try and change it. You know, that's where I take the responsibility going, all right, I'm going to go take, you know, self-improve. I'm going to go work somewhere else and do something different. Yeah. So I mean, like I, you know, I, 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 on that one, I would say, you know, I would still look to him and say, okay, if, if you've got people that are unhappy, you know, I think if you're saying like, okay, isolate incidents here and there, but if there's sort of like a widespread problem, like Walmart's a good example and, and Amazon, like, you know, you've got the examples of like people peeing in bottles, you've got low pay and things like yeah, that. Yeah, right? I agree with so that. If yeah. you can handle that stuff, like, I guess what I'm saying is I think where we could probably agree is if the material conditions for people are, are taken care of, people are paid well, they've got health care, they've got needs are being met by the job, because that's all it is, it's transaction, right? Job is, right. is I give you money for your labor. And then all this other stuff is what makes it better, what makes it enjoyable yeah. that makes it purpose driven it makes it exciting is that's all the stuff the mission statement the purpose but a job is you pay me for the time and if as long as that's well ten, tended to taking care of people's needs yep and then somebody's not happy there provided that there's alternatives in the marketplace for them i would say i agree with you 100 percent. yeah no look I, I totally agree with you i look at amazon i look at walmart versus costco i go to costco i go into costco you know Every Saturday or Sunday, one one Saturday or Sunday, we 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 recognize the employees there. The employees have seen my kids grow up from the time they were you know, six years old. Now they're in college and they're looking at them going, oh "My gosh, you know, you see the same employees there for twenty some years." Yep, and they're happy because they're well paid, the conditions are good, they're well taken care of. They've got, and then I think about Walmart, which does everything it can does everything it can do to keep employees working part-time so they don't have to pay their health care. Yep. And then you see it in the stores. Now Walmart has, you know, can't argue about their cheap prices, but I've never walked into a Walmart store and said, gee, am I happy to shop here? Yeah. And that's the difference. And, and so, you hit, you, you hit the nail right on the head when you talk about if, you know, if conditions are not, you know, a CEO should be looking at like, oh, yeah how could we let this happen? Yeah. You know, and, and, and if they did let it happen, you're like, how could we possibly do that? Yeah. So. Well, you brought up Costco. I want to take us on a very, very, very slight detour. That's completely irrelevant to anything we just talked about because you brought it up though. And I know you're an appreciator and you're a podcaster and I'm a podcaster. I got to tell you about this idea I had for a podcast. thought it the other day, my, uh, my, my wife's uncle loves Costco, like loves, 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 loves Costco. My dad loves, 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 loves Costco. Anybody I know that goes to Costco loves Costco thought of an idea for a podcast that was just called I Love Costco. It would be a Costco podcast and it would be hosted by, by people who shop at Costco. You find somebody who like really loves it and they just bring on people who shop at Costco and they just talk about their favorite products and things that they like. Because every time I talk to someone who goes to Costco, they've got a laundry list of, oh, my favorite things here are this, or they even know people there. They're like, oh, I see Fred every time I go in and blah, 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 blah. Well, you think about a business, what would your business look like? If everybody loved it, like people love Costco for serious, 
That is what 100% would, crazy. What would you, you, know, you think about every business in the world and you're going, if I drove my business and everybody loved it like people love Costco, what great things could we do? Yep. And, you know, there's your goal, right? Yeah. As, as a leader or as a business owner or whatever. We want to be like Costco. That's the North Star. Yeah. That's the North Star. <laughs> and you're going, all right, we want people to love us. So, so that's. So uh, in every business, there needs to be a rotisserie chicken at the back of the, at the back of the shop. <laughs> that's a lost leader. Yep. Yeah. Right, lost right. leader. Delicious chicken. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, but at the, and cheap gas, but anyway, Lessons learned. <laughs> but, but that's the, yeah, that's the fun thing. I always, maybe that's just the takeaway, but uh, so your book is out. Yeah. Where yeah. can people, where can people find that? So the book is uh, online retailers. You got Amazon, you got, um, you know, Apple books, you've got Barnes and Noble, all the, all the spots online, you can get it. Um, super proud of it. You know, I, I think, I don't know about you, you, you know, you've in your illustrious career, I'm sure there's things you look back on, you're proud of things you regret. I find for myself, it's often difficult to acknowledge past accomplishments. Um, and I really am just always looking at the next thing. Mm -hmm. But this book is probably the first thing that I've put out where I'm like, you know what, this is a verse, this is a verse I put into the universe, that I am proud. And I am I am unreservedly proud that it's out there. So um, I do hope that people go pick up a copy. It's about how to build uh, teams with trust, respect and kindness, uh, awesome. and how to become the kind of leader that you would love to follow. And it's, it's called the lovable leader, the lovable leader. Yep. Good. How do people get a hold of you? So I'm easy to find uh, the easiest place to, I, I created this nifty little uh, webpage that essentially directs to everything I do because I found I was coming onto podcasts or on my own and saying like, we can go here for this or here for this or here for that. So I just created one that's like a directory. So jgibbard.com, just J and then my last name, Gibbard, G-I-B-B-A-R-D.com, jgibbard.com. That links to like everything I'm currently doing. So it's got my side projects, it's got my primary projects, it's got my content, it's got all my stuff. Uh, you know, people can subscribe to my really awesome newsletter that comes out twice a week called Becoming Superhuman. It's tips on how to grow and be amazing. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I do lots of cool stuff and I hope people go and find me. And, and you do it all in four days a week and you spend Friday with your daughter. Yep. And, and the fun secret is actually, I, I didn't mention this, Craig, but Mondays I actually use primarily for planning. So I just take the day and I kind of spend the first half of the day just planning out what I'm going to do Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then the second half of Monday, I mostly do content like podcasts and blogging and things like that. So I basically work with clients Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, I'm, I'm off with my daughter. It can be done. It can be done. It can be done. Like when you get to a point where you, you can charge high billable rates to do very high value projects that, you know, take the time that they do, then, you know, that's how you make it happen. That's how I made it happen, at least. Awesome. I love it. Jeff, thanks for coming on today. A great conversation. Really enjoyed having you. Let's do it thanks, again. Craig. Appreciate it, man. Talk soon. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig at NorthStarESG.com, or check us out at www.NorthStarESG.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.